Um, when did you actually start writing material for the new soundtrack? Did you have ideas all over the years or did you just start writing fresh when you got in contact with Appeal again and started on the production of the sequel? I started writing the sequel when uh, Appeal was um, doing the original sequel for Outcast back in what 2001 2002 wherever that whenever that was at that point i had some materials from them uh, as far as things like story and stuff like that and that that had that are similar to what we've got here some of the characters within the game and that got the juices going i started thinking about it back then made some notes uh of some things that i wanted to do and so when it came time to actually you know this Outcast 2 project coming to fruition, I, uh, I kind of looked back at some of those notes, some of those things carried through. You know, the process that I do, you know, on every project, which is that I work with what's given to me in the moment and the material that I receive that, that triggers emotions within me and triggers uh, ideas musically. And so in the context of Outcast 2, um, you know the artwork that i saw in the over the course of development the environments the the characters all, all those little elements they uh, they speak to me in a particular way and I, i have an emotional reaction to it and then i sort of channel that into whatever i'm doing musically so pretty much the outcast two score is not like just me rehashing some thought i had 20 years ago it's it's really like looking at what this game is and what's this story and how do I want to tell it with the music. Is there any music theme or like a motif you like took over to this score? Yes, um, there are recurring themes from the original game that, that I utilize in uh, Outcast 2. The, The first score, uh, the original Outcast, the technique's called leitmotif, and it's just these little themes, little motifs, and you sort of weave them into the score. So in typical, like classical opera uh, kind of approach where there's thematic ideas and you use those thematic ideas as transitional material to kind of move from one part of the story to another. So there's what I call the adventure theme, which is the theme that everybody's heard from the original Outcast main titles. So that's still alive because it's still an adventure. And then um, there are some themes that were themes from regions within the original game that I hint at, you know, and I play with them a bit more. So it's kind of like I'm still playing in the little sandbox of the Outcast universe. But you know, as far as central themes, there's the classic adventure theme from the original one. And then there's two new themes that are central themes. One is for a certain enemy. And then the other one is what I call the Earth Adelpha connection theme. I, I, I haven't I haven't given it a good name yet. It's, I, it's got the sucky name right now. Uh, <laughs> but it's just this this thing that was in the original game that sort of interconnection between the world of Adelpha and the world of Earth. Uh, that Cutter uh, Slade's character comes from. So uh, I wanted to have some sort of big dramatic theme for that. So, What would you say are like the biggest differences between the both scores from the first and the second game? The biggest difference is there is a, a hella more music. <laughs> uh, the original score... Uh, For the first game was about an hour's worth of music and this is two and a quarter hours of music the, so that's one huge difference it's a lot lot more material uh the second huge difference is the music design component which is uh comparatively in the original game everything was just stereo audio files uh, on a music cd The game was programming was put onto your computer, but it would play that little music CD whenever there was music moments. And so the music design was very, very different than what we're doing here. The sort of big difference between then and now is we have all sorts of cool tools available to us now that allow us to take all sorts of audio, whether it's sound design or music, and 
really do a very robust music playback system. So it's deep, it's robust, it is bulky, and it's more complicated um, as, as far as this score compared to the original one, because the original score, I was just writing material that at its most complicated, it would potentially loop. And here, um, without getting into ultra specifics, there's lots of layers vertically of lots of different things that can happen, um, in it, you know, where things get added together. And there's a lot of horizontal things, which are what we call procedural audio, which is, you know, based on whatever's going on in the game and how music plays in a linear format, like from what you're hearing to some sort of game state change like let's say you've you've gone from one location to another and if the location music is different then how do we get between these two elements so a lot of a lot of material like I, the number of transitions that i've built were like just insane who came up with the idea what was the idea behind like uh, adding uh, solo vocals to the game, or like a solo singer to the game? A solo singer uh, was added. Um, that idea came up 20 years ago with a particular character. And I had this idea of a solo vocal to help represent that character. And uh, so that idea was an older idea. I originally was thinking like an operatic kind of approach, but once I got to see what the character looked like in Outcast 2, you know, and then I wanted, I wanted to treat it a little differently. The solo vocal stuff uh, is very specific and it is influenced by a lot of uh, world music. The time frame of when you actually write the music, mix it, finish it, deliver it, it might be a couple of months, it might be a month, it might be a very fast turnaround. So to spend a year and a half, two years early on thinking about what's, what should the music system be? What should the, what should the text for, for the vocalists be? You know, a lot of times with media projects, you don't have much time to think. So you just do the best craft that you're capable of doing and you, you spend a lifetime being really good at that and uh but when you have time to just kind of revisit things and go yeah do i still like it today i know i wrote it two months ago but do i still like it today yeah yeah or make you know you can make little alterations things like that and that just makes it uh, more nuanced and uh in the end it makes it you know a couple steps better Uh, how was it for the singer and the choir to record in Agasork? Any experience you can share about the recording process? Yeah, for the solo vocalist, for Matilda Mann, she um, and me just had some phone conversations and where I pronounced stuff for her. And uh, she's an experienced vocalist that's done, you know, everything from opera to contemporary music. Uh, and part of your training, if you do any sort of opera, is you have to learn a lot of languages. You have to learn German, you have to learn Italian, you have to learn Latin. Uh, so for her, uh, it was just one phone conversation and she was fine. I sent emails to the choir master with the, the phonetic pronunciation. So I'd have the whole all the lyrics with the phonetic pronunciation. I sent some emails like, if you want to have like a Zoom conversation, you know, and they're like, choir master's like, no, nah, it's cool. I, it, that makes complete sense. I have it. Totally makes sense. I got it. And then we get to the recording sessions and generally everything worked pretty smoothly because that choir master, I do not know that person's name, uh, but I believe that he just, he did his homework and, uh, you know, came prepared and did a really nice job as far as, you know, informing the choir. So sometimes there were little delays and then we used Skype to type back and forth instructions. So there wasn't a vocal instruction where I could pronounce anything. So I had to type in phonetic stuff into Skype <laughs> so that the production and the recording team 
knew, but I was also like typing into Skype the English translations and just asked that the choir master let the choir know what the translations were. They may not have known what they were singing. And sometimes if you just tell musicians aesthetically what you're going for, you know, or in this case, telling the choir what the translation is, they hear that and they may have their own idea and own interpretation. And then they're going to emote that when they sing. And I find I get better performances out of those kinds of musicians by just communicating those kinds of ideas. One of the things I should probably say is that at some point we'll be able to talk in more depth about some of the mechanics of how the music system came together and uh, be able to share a lot more stuff. It's probably going to be closer to when the game is either released or maybe slightly before. It depends on uh, when we get permission to do those kinds of things. And this is pretty normal for any sort of, you know, video game uh, kind of project as far as when that information comes out. Because we don't want get people getting too excited and then they got to still wait <laughs> for the game to come out. Um, so we're trying to like, trying to pull the excitement level at, at a uh, controllable pace. <laughs> so that being said, uh, there will be a lot more uh, that will be revealed. And I'm looking forward to having, having those kinds of conversations and sharing stuff with everybody on that.